Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Matthew Hardy, the CEO of the Pacific Asia Travel Association. And today I'm actually joined by uh, Dr. Uh, Parag Khanna, who is a futurist, a scientist, an advisor to government, an author of uh, several interesting books, and uh, a discussion we'll have today on, on one of his latest books that he actually wrote called Connectography, or wrote uh, some time ago, uh, which I think is really relevant to today's uh, situation with COVID-19. And we'll come up and talk about this a little bit later on. But um, uh, Dr. Parag, please uh, just uh, introduce yourself a little bit more about some of the activities you're working on and uh, maybe some of your latest initiatives. It's so great to speak with you, Mario, and thank you for inviting me on. Um, you know, I am a traveler at heart. It's, uh, you know, I was actually doing a written interview recently, um, and I was asked, you know, how would you describe yourself or what quote best defines you? And I said, you know, first and foremost, I'm a traveler, and I sort of live by the motto, I travel, therefore I am. Um, and I think I was, you know, sort of just born with this condition, you will, so it's very appropriate to be speaking with you. But I am a, a social scientist, a political scientist, an academic. I've done a lot of work with governments around the world, uh, the US, Europe, and Asia. I live now in Singapore. My books are you know, largely concerned with globalization. You might even say the geopolitics of globalization, the competition. Uh, but I look a lot at economic issues, uh, for sure, around national development strategies, the role of the services industry. Obviously, hospitality and tourism fits in very strongly there. I have a strong interest in human capital, talent. How do we develop and nurture talent? And the next book that I'm uh, writing is actually about the future of human geography, which is to say migration. And I'm trying to answer the question, if there are 9 billion people in the world in the year 2050, where will we live? You know, why will we be where we will be? How did we get there? And those are some of the big kinds of questions that I like to tackle. Um, I had the pleasure a few months ago to, to meet you in person. We're actually now actually having these virtual discussions for, for due to the current situations. Uh, but I met you, your wife, and your daughter, and you have a very special family. Uh, your wife is one of the leading minds in artificial intelligence. Your daughter, 10 years old, is uh, the CEO of a, of a travel company called Opta. Uh, a very interesting family, and I, I, I just can't imagine the type of conversation you have around at the dinner table. <laughs> well, I think we have the, in contrast to, uh, to the esteemed uh, description you've just given, we have the, quite frankly, the silliest conversations imaginable <laughs> at the dinner table. It's probably a good relief or respite uh, from, you know, coding and uh, computer science and math uh, homework. And for me, you know, writing and researching and having my head buried in books all day. So we're, we're pretty lighthearted. And uh, given the current lockdown, uh, our cherished hour is just exercising together, kind of exercising in yoga and, you know, sort of like tripping over each other like a big game of Twister. Um, but, you know, I think we've, uh, you know, I don't think that neither my wife, Aisha, nor I set out to be entrepreneurs. We're definitely very different kinds of entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, she's very into technology and I do more kind of, you know, consulting and advisory with, with official institutions. Um, and, and, and Zara, you know, our daughter you mentioned is, you know, what she does, she gets the traveling from me and she gets the coding and the you know, computer science from her mom. So basically her chatbot Okta is this fusion of the love of travel and you know, this sort of uh, education in technology. Excellent. Well, actually all have a, a very fascinating family and uh, I, I'd love to have, uh, invite you all for dinner when, next time you come to Bangkok <laughs> so we, we can explore. Love to. Uh, more of these discussions. Um, one of the reasons I reach out to you today is that uh, recently I started to actually read your, your book uh, called Connectography, uh, which I found absolutely fascinating. I'm about uh, a quarter, half, halfway in, into the book at the moment and can't wait to go back to it and read the rest of it. Um, but I, I'm going to read a quote for you and, and just like to, you to ex explore this a little bit more uh, from, from your book. It says, uh, Connectography is ahead of the curve in seeing the battlefield of the future and a new kind of tug of war be, being waged on it. Uh, Kenna's scholarship and foresight are world class and must read for the next president, uh, Chuck Agel, former US Secretary of Defense. Um, where the idea of this book, Connectography, came from? And then to, can you explain to us in just in, in, in simple words what connectography is actually mean to you? 
Sure. Um, you know, so it's a fusion, right, of uh, two words, connectivity and geography. And, uh, you know, in a way, this that book is the culmination of, you know, again, many years of just reflecting on this intersection of geopolitics and globalization. So globalization is kind of the embodiment of all of that connectivity we have, all of that infrastructure, all of the highways and railways and oil and gas pipelines and internet cables, all of that is the infrastructure, the physical backbone of global connectivity. And then we have uh, geopolitics, you know, the competition uh, for power, for supply chains, uh, for resources, to build industries, military power. Um, and what I find is that we compete much more over that connectivity than we do over borders, right? There are very few actual active, hostile, international border conflicts in the world today, maybe just one or two. But that tug of war that you mentioned, that, that tug of war is that competition over a rope. I mean, the sport tug of war, as I, I talk about in the book, is this 10,000 year old sport. It's the oldest team sport in the world is tug of war. There, there are cave drawings depicting uh, people waging tug of war. And to me, it's a fascinating metaphor because it's really about fighting over something that connects us. And we're connected, so universally connected by infrastructure and supply chains. And we're competing every minute. So we're not competing over borders anymore. We're competing over supply chains, right? Who makes the most medical devices and ventilators? Who has the largest share of the automotive market? Who controls the supply of the world's semiconductors? That's what countries and cities, nations, uh, uh, empires are fighting over right now every second of every day. Where are the internet cables? Where are the servers? Where is the data being housed? All of that is tug of war over connectivity. Um, so, you know, we've gone from a war between systems. If you remember, you know, the Cold War was a war between two systems, two rival blocks that were divided from each other. Today, we live in this one collective connected system and we have war within that system, uh, you know, to control that connectivity. So that's the underlying premise of the book. And as you know, I kind of, you know, go through it with a lot of maps and visualizations that kind of bring to life this, this connectivity. You know, for, for I'm actually in, in another section of your book where we talk about globalizations and, and uh, certainly for the last uh, decade or so we we've we've been promoting globalizations uh you know working more together more connectivity as you mentioned and etc but don't you feel that uh, the current sentiment with with the u.s president and other countries in europe also there is more of this nationalistic point of view where people are focusing on making their country great again um and and is that a contradiction to the concept of globalization uh, you know, yes, yes and no. Uh, for one thing, you know, every country should want to make itself great, right? Uh, so <laughs> I suppose that in and of itself, the phrase is not harmful, but obviously the way it's used uh, by the Trump administration uh, connotes a certain jingoism, nationalism, which is different from patriotism, right? Patriotism is being proud of your country and everyone, you know, ideally lives in a country uh, about which they can be proud. Uh, but, but nationalism is saying, you know, me at the expense of you. And uh, that actually doesn't really work very well for America, given how you know, uh, connected it is to the rest of the world. Um, so it actually has negative consequences. And so there, there are two things that I want to point out in response to your question. The first is that not every country is acting in that way. And we do have a bias, you know, as English speakers coming from the Anglo-American world towards thinking that what we say is representative of the world because we hear ourselves speaking to each other in English and reading the New York Times, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, you know, and The Economist. But the truth is that that's, you know, that's about 8% um, of the human population. Um, and not everyone in those countries, in any case, agrees with the policies. You know, I mean, Trump lost the popular vote, right, in his own country, in America. So I think we have to be very clear that there's a big difference between, um, you know, what a leader says and whether it's representative, uh, what a leader says and does and whether it's even good for his country in the first place, um, and whether or not that leader, whether it's Trump or Brexit you know, or whatever, um, is actually represents what the world is doing. Because I can say fairly definitively that what the world is doing is building more connectivity. You know, we can have uh, 10 nationalist leaders in the world who grab the headlines. But the fact is that those countries are 
trying to export more. They're trying to attract more investment. They're trying to draw in talent uh, and all of these other things that actually are all about globalization and connectivity. So I think that we have to be really clear you know, about our terms and what they mean and what, again, what people say, what they do and whether or not that's actually representative. So there are actually these sort of you know, trends that are so much deeper, building connectivity, building infrastructure, you know, um, are trends that are so much deeper. We're talking about 10,000 year trends and Trump is neither a blip nor a footnote, you know, uh, in, in, in comparison to the power of those trends. You know, in your in your book, you also talk about uh, obviously the, the the future and then and and also about technology. And we talk about the Internet of Everything or the Internet of Things, Internet of People, and how our world is actually getting even more connected, as you mentioned uh, before. Uh, I'm not as an expert as your wife is, but I am fascinated by artificial intelligence. That's certainly something I've been studying too and working with. Um, but how, how do you see AI and also the Internet of Things? And uh, we know that many businesses around the world now are actually trying to develop uh, ways for getting the entire world access to the Internet, uh, even people in remote areas. How do you think the world will change with this extra uh, extraordinary connectivity that we'll all have access to uh, in, in, a, in the near future? Well, you know, we are getting closer and closer to universal internet access because we are almost at universal mobile phone access and that those phones are increasingly smartphones and those phones are increasingly connected to not just 3G or 4G, but eventually 5G networks. So we're not that far away from a world in which every you know, individual or at least every family um, has a 5G mobile phone uh, and a smartphone. So that means everyone will have internet access. So, and, and no doubt that the falling cost of uh, communications and, and, and technology and hardware um, and deregulation has brought us towards that world where the mobile phone is the most universally distributed technology in human history. You know, many people have cited uh, this sort of, uh, you know, statistic that far more people have mobile phones than access to fresh water or toilets uh, in the world. And I think that's obviously tells us something about our kind of, you know, ethical priorities, uh, but it also is just a fact. Um, so, you know, AI ultimately is, uh, you know, using training, collecting and training data uh, to learn and to anticipate and to substitute and to do certain functions. So the more people are online, the more people are connected, the more access to data there is, the more we can learn about our behavior, anticipate our behavior, and train you know, algorithms to support us in some ways, to replace us in other ways. So I think it's these things go hand in hand, you know, universality of technology and developing AI uh, to support our needs. So let's take an obvious current example, and that is, uh, you know, anticipating the outbreak of pandemics. So, you know, we, there are, there are uh, and this is, goes back at least 10 years, but just by tracking uh, Google searches for symptoms of flu. So individual people go online and, and they type in words like, I think I have the flu, or what are the symptoms of the flu? And you know, by searching that metadata anonymously, suddenly, you know, from a from an immunological perspective, epidemiological perspective, we're able to say, hey, I'm seeing a signal here. We think there might be something wrong in that zip code in that town. Let's go figure out what's going on. So that that is partially, you know, a result of machine learning, uh, you know, algorithms. Yeah, I think also, you know, the company I, I worked with uh, before I joined uh, uh, Pata, um, we, we were tracking all uh, flights uh, uh, around the world in, in real time. Um, and we had developed a, a piece of uh, application software that was able to kind of predict how fast a pandemic would actually, you know, spread on a global basis, uh, based of it on its point of origin. And, it was fascinating because we, 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 the way it was built, we could actually go back into 40 years of history and, and just zoom in on one city or one uh, country around the world and then just track it, slide it all the way over to the current year and see how fast uh, the, the, the increase of air connectivity has increased over that period of time. The, the sheer volume of flight on a daily basis flying across the world 
but at the same time also the scary part was to actually see that the moment the pandemic is declared in one place how fast it could actually spread on a global basis and and today we're actually living we're going through that situation at, at the moment oh absolutely so you know you're reminding me that uh when the when i saw that a couple of the major uh, COVID-19 hotspots were Italy and Iran, it brought me back to the 14th century because when the plague broke out, the Black Death, it spread from China uh, westward along the Silk Roads. It devastated the Iranian population, the Persian population at the time, and it entered Europe through the port of Genoa in Italy. And so Italy suffered massively from the Black Death and Persia suffered massively from the Black Death. And I couldn't help but draw the comparison. Now that played out actually over uh, five years and here it plays out over five days or five weeks, you might say. Uh, so that's the impact of accelerated connectivity on things that might have happened anyway, but taken much more time to play out. And that makes the system, the global system, much more complex because you have these feedback loops that spread globally much more rapidly. That doesn't make, you know, I just want to point out globalization a bad thing. And, you know, there's a long section of connectography where I, where I talk about this. I say, look, there's the positive and the negative sides, right? The fact that we can speak to each other over Zoom, the fact that we can travel around the world and, and, and you know, be with, uh, you know, family and friends and, you know, never lose touch and, and share global resources, um, you know, such as we do, is all the result of connectivity and globalization. But uh, at the same time, you can have uh, cyber hacking spread globally, pandemic spread globally, terrorists spread globally as well as a result of some of the same pathways. And so, you know, it's not that globalization is good or bad. We have to learn to manage it better. And we manage it through the forces of flow and friction, right? You allow the good things to flow, but you create friction for the bad things. And friction can be borders, right? Um, you know, borders or checkpoints and controls. And if we get better at imposing these frictions on the bad things, but enabling the flow of the good things, then we will uh, improve the way in which we manage globalization. I, I'd like to come back to, to the current situation in a few minutes, but uh, first, uh, there was something in your book that I actually found uh, really interesting, and I wanted to expand uh, on, on it a little bit more. Uh, it said by 2030, more than 70% of the world, uh, world people will live in cities, and with most of them located within 50 miles of the sea. How will this actually transform our, our way of living moving forward and our movements of people moving forward? It's a great question. And so, you know, that isn't my prediction per se, but it's a kind of extrapolation that many people have cited based on existing trends. You know, urbanization is a very robust trend. The fact that we congregate around bodies of water or coastal areas is obviously a historical reality. But, um, you know, if you think about climate change, right, we have to potentially reverse that trajectory. So, you know, living in... Uh, Ho Chi Minh City or uh, Manila or Jakarta, you know, many coastal, many of the world's coastal mega cities are in Asia. Many of them are vulnerable to rising sea levels. And even though their populations are growing now, it could well be that if climate change accelerates, then those populations will have to retreat uh, somewhat and we'll have to think about new geographies of settlement. So we may still be urbanizing, but we probably won't necessarily move en masse to the same places, we may need to move to new places, uh, higher elevation, uh, for example, more inland. Um, so, you know, will we continue to feel the urge to live together, you know, in, in, in cities? Yes, that is a 7,000 year old phenomenon. Um, and it's probably going to continue. But will we have to relocate our cities because of climate change? That's also uh, true. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I personally actually been living in city for most of my life. And um, the thing I can't wait to do is when I retire to actually <laughs> move outside of the city as far as possible from the city, <laughs> from the city um, and uh, which is probably the opposite of what most most other people are doing at the moment. Um, in, in, in your book, you, you, you say that connectivity is destiny. Well, what did you mean by that? Um, you know, that is in some ways the, the thesis or the punchline, you know, or kind of a foundation of the argument. And again, I was looking for what are the things that you can 
genuinely say universally across time about the human species. And that's a fairly bold, you know, sort of undertaking, but it's actually not a very difficult question to answer, as it turns out. You can't say that we share language or religion or ethnicity or race or ideology. None of those things do we share universally as humans. What you can say for absolutely certain about the last 10,000 years of human history or the last 60,000 years since we began spreading across the continents, um, the only thing you can definitively say is that we build connectivity with whatever tool available to us, whether it is stone or whether it is steel. Um, we use whatever technology we have at our disposal to connect to each other. We congregate in cities and settlements, and we build infrastructure to connect those settlements to each other. That is literally, I cannot think of anything other than the biological commonality that we have that you can say is true about human behavior as a collective, as the, again, the eight billion of us alive today. And so that's not just some kind of hypothesis, that's actually a fact about us as humans. So it's so important to recognize this because it's also anthropologically important. Because if you think about the way a lot of people talk about humanity, we say, well, we are tribal. You know, we divide ourselves up by our skin color, by our race, you know, and so forth. Well, the truth is, you know, that that might be true in many places, uh, but it's not universally true. Otherwise, if that were true, then how could it be that today, the nation state, the ethnically pure nation state, is becoming uh, decreasingly the norm. More and more countries are multi-ethnic, right? Have more diverse populations, have more immigration, have a higher percentage of foreign-born residents, right? Have more intermarriage. What you could actually call, you know, genetic dilution, is happening voluntarily around the world. So you can't say that we are inherently tribal, you know, but you can say that. Almost the entire population, you know, is, is connected and getting more and more physically connected to each other. And that's not the result of anyone forcing us to do it. This is literally voluntary. This is the sum total of all of our voluntary behavior over tens of thousands of years. So I genuinely believe that connectivity is an impulse. It is an innate part of who we are is to connect to each other. And that to me is, again, it is truly the deepest statement we can say, uh, uh, say about ourselves. And therefore, connectivity is truly our destiny, is to become more and more and more connected. And by the way, when you do retire and move as far away from the city as possible, you're going to be connected because we've connected every single place. You know, you're going to have, uh, you know, mesh network, 5G, satellite, Wi-Fi, <laughs> and you'll still be in touch. You will be connected. Oh, I, I don't get me wrong. I don't want to be disconnected from the world <laughs> in, in, in any way. But I, 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 do, I do appreciate uh, nature very much. And uh, uh, being in lockdown now for almost a month, I actually do miss uh, the blue color of the oceans and the greens of the forest and uh, I really miss nature. And I think that's probably the first thing I'll do as soon as we come out of this lockout, lock, lockdown is to uh, find, a, find nature as uh, quickly as possible. Um, I, I'd like now to move on to, to uh, talk about the current situ situation, but also um, you and I and, and your daughter and, and my sons actually share a, a common passion, which is, which is travel. Uh, I know that uh, with your family, you've traveled extensively, uh, as I did. Uh, I'm actually now at uh, country number 99, so I was looking forward to do my 100th, but I guess I'll have to wait a bit longer for that. Um, and uh, What will your son, number 100 be? What will your, your one number 100 be? You know, many, many people on social media and friends who, who know about my country count uh, have been asking me this question. and. Uh, I, I honestly do not know. Uh, there are so many places I really want to go, and I haven't really made up my mind as to where it would be. Um, Let me know if you want so, any tips. Sure, sure. <laughs> I'm the resident I, I, travel advisor for, <laughs> for everyone. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to. I mean, Iran is one, one country that I would really love to go, but uh, sadly, with the current situation, it's uh, not only the current situation, but also uh, the situation with, uh, with travel restrictions to Iran it's probably a bit difficult. Uh, one that I'm actually quite um, intrigued by is uh, Saudi, uh, which now is actually open to, to tourism again. Mm -hmm. 
Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's certainly actually one on, on, the, on the top of my list to go and explore. I, I've, I've got some good friends in Saudi who shared uh, some beautiful pictures of, of uh, many places of the ancient uh, Nabataean uh, cultures and heritage. And, uh, um, and there are so many. There are so many other places. I'd yeah. Like Iran is, is magical. Yeah. You know, it, it was on my, my sort of bucket list for a long time. And I'm, I'm so grateful that I did get a chance to go and to kind of experience firsthand the, the culture, the, the pride, uh, the heritage that the country has to offer to meet so many young people because it is an overwhelmingly young country. Um, you know, so I, I, I treasure that one time that I spent about 10 days there. And I wrote a number of articles, uh, you know, from that trip. Um, Saudi also is obviously a fascinating country, and you know, much more complex, obviously, than than a lot of outside coverage of it uh, suggests. You mentioned the Nabataeans, you know, and it's so funny because we're given the lockdown. Uh, we're watching Lawrence of Arabia, which is a four-hour-long movie. And uh, so we're watching it with the kids in parts and kind of explaining the history of the, you know, Ottoman Empire and the tensions uh, with the Arab tribes. So we're up at the parts actually where, uh, where Lawrence is, you know, you know, rallying different tribes in, uh, in, in the, what, you know, Western uh, regions of uh, Saudi Arabia right now. But they filmed a lot of the movie um, in Jordan. And he obviously spent time in Jordan as well. And there are Nabataean, uh, you know, ruins uh, in uh, in uh, southern uh, Jordan, which I've also been to. And if you haven't been, that's another must 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 do trip. No, oh, actually, I've been to to Jordan uh, at least five or six times now already. Oh, uh, great! We we have some good friends there, and that uh, we're in touch with on a regular basis. And it's always a country we. We love to go. Actually, this this week uh, today, uh, we were meant to be in Jordan for for a wedding, uh, but sadly, because of the, the current situation, we've not been able to travel. And the wed obviously, the wedding has been uh, uh, postponed to a later time. So we will be going back to Jordan sometime, hopefully later this year. And I hope this young couple will will do eventually, <laughs> uh, and and we'll go back. Uh, but. Um, you know, this, this, uh, the, the current situation we're living to at the mo uh, going through at the moment is something I certainly I've never experienced in my lifetime, and I think uh, most people haven't either. Um, on, uh, I, I went to and lived through different crises in, in uh, many years, from terrorism attack to natural disasters to political coup and all sorts of other crises, uh, but never I, I would have expected something of of this nature, where we have an entire world on lockdowns, uh, people not even able to go out of their house or very limited movement, uh, entire aircraft fleets being grounded, uh, not a, no planes flying, um, and and so much more. And uh, this is really difficult situation. It's a health crisis. It's an economic crisis. It's a social crisis uh, where people are actually. You know, I've been in, in our house now for nearly a month. Um, and, uh, you know, the only interactions we've been having are, are, are actually in a virtual world. Uh, my sons are uh, in different parts of the world. One, one is, uh, was in Canada, was uh, repatriated to France uh, just uh, two weeks ago. The oldest is in the UK. And uh, we're separated and we don't know when we're going to see each other again. Um, it's a very, very difficult time for, for everyone. It's it's really remarkable, and I have uh, obviously a lot of sympathy for for a wide range of people right now who are sort of you know stuck, uh, not just physically stuck, but don't work in these ties, you know, or really don't have resilience in a way through digital connectivity to, to continue working. That, that's extremely uh, troubling. And then, of course, those people, you know, we, we see the stories now every day who can't say goodbye to loved ones who are sick and who have, literally, you know, tragically passed away, lost their lives uh, to the virus. They can only, you know, FaceTime or Skype with them. And this is, you know, horrible. The, some of the, you know, for many of us, when, when, if and when this does end, we'll, we'll look back at it you know, uh, memorably, may, may perhaps neither positively nor negatively, and just, you know, remember it as a really strange interregnum. But this is the traumatic event uh, for human civilization uh, as a whole. Nothing, nothing really compares, at least not in, not in my lifetime.
You know, many people over the, the past few weeks uh, have asked me the question, the question that everybody has got in their mind is, when will this end? Um, when are we going to go back to normal? And, and to be honest, my answer is, first is, I don't know. If I knew exactly when we're going to go back to a more normalcy, um, I think I could probably bet some money and, and, and become really rich. But um, uh, I, I think nobody, nobody really knows how long this is going to go. Um, I do believe strongly, however, that uh, borders will not open in one snap. Uh, I believe that you know, cities and states and countries will open to each other progressively. And how uh, the, the travel industry, tourism industry will change moving forward is, is the big question that we all have in our mind at the moment. We do know that they will change. Uh, will it change for the better? Will it change for more complexities in the way we have to travel in terms of health certifications or other means that we may have to go through in order to get visas to travel to different places? These are all questions that we're all asking ourselves at the moment, uh, but we do believe they will be different. Um, what are your views on, on the current situation and in terms of travel moving forward well it's you know the crisis is one of overcapacity, right in in economic terms because now we have a world population that as you rightly point out is you know there's going to be precautionary savings does not have as much income discretionary income to go out and travel then there are going to be the persistent restrictions and and, and obstacles with respect to whether or not one is um, you know has a herd immunity certificate in their passport or not. Um, a lot of caution, you know, bilaterally, which countries will open up to other countries. You know, first the Schengen area has to reopen even mm -hmm. for Europeans, which has been the most open cross-border zone in the world uh, in recent decades. So it's really gonna be a gradual recovery. And then the competition really, you know, to attract uh, tourists and travelers and families and, and businesses uh, for, for conferences and conventions. Um, there's going to be fewer of them. So we're going to have, we have overcapacity. We're going to have a lot of underutilized capacity. A lot of hotels are not going to reach, you know, full occupancy for a long time. And I think that that is, you know, it, it, and on top, beneath all of that, by the way, you know, Mario, is, is this issue of the actual demographics of the world because the world population is not growing in perpetuity. Uh, you know, actually the world population is starting to plateau and level off. Um, so, you know, increasingly we'll be competing more and more for fewer and fewer uh, travelers, if you will, unless, of course, we were to have greater equality, you know, and greater consumption, less poverty, you know, more people able to, uh, to, to consume, to move, to travel, uh, to enjoy, whether it's for business or pleasure. Um, and then we have the pressure to do all of that sustainably, right, not to just have it return, you know, to, to the old model. Um, so all of these things kind of coexist. You have to stir them in a pot in a complex way. There's not just one factor uh, to look at in terms of what's the right answer, where are people going to go. Um, I think all of these, these macro kinds of issues like the demographics and the economics and the sustainability pressures are going to impact. Uh, you know, the, the tourism, the hospitality, and the aviation uh, industry. So it is such an important one structurally, you know, literally better than anyone, but it's worth repeating for everyone listening that, you know, the, the, the hospitality industry, the tourism industry is more than 10% of GDP. It's more than 10% of global employment. You know, uh, you can only say that otherwise about maybe the construction industry, right? So this is really, and they, they obviously relate to each other as well are so systemically relevant, so globally important, such an important part of the economies of so many countries and the livelihoods of so many families all over the world. And by every forecast you know, and measure and study that's out there right now, these are the ones that are gonna take the longest to recover. Um, so I do think that you know, there's, there is sadly, you know, or for better or worse, uh, a lot of time right now for us to think about how to, to reinvent. Um, you know, you're again at the forefront, obviously, of, of thinking about it. Uh, we, as kind of you know, incubating a small uh, travel, a digital travel company that that is our daughters. You know, we're thinking about it. You know, emphasizing the family, emphasizing shared experience, emphasizing spending more time together, potentially in one place. Um, you know, and maybe those will become some of the the new norms that the industry has to think about. The 
optimistic in me I actually think that you know this is a great opportunity for us to reinvent the tourism industry there was um, a lot of concerns with with uh, over tourism in many destinations that was uh, talked about before the crisis uh, concerns that you know environmentally and it wasn't responsible and sustainable uh, for for the industry to continue to promote and encourage mass tourism um, and this is this is obviously a great opportunity for us to reinvent the industry to realign ourselves uh, to, to a new normal um, but on the other hand I also know that it's very easy for everyone to fall back into their old habits um, to go back to market sources that uh, were easier to get before and then to think well if we want to grow back because you know the economy has suffered so much we all need to generate new incomes we need to re-employ people and etc to fall back into uh, the old habit of, of getting as many people as possible into a destination um, so i'm very divided on this topic at the moment where i see a great opportunity and I, I have a desire to help destinations and to help businesses to to move in the direction of being more responsible uh, but i also very concerned and afraid that the, the old habits will, will go back well what are your views on on um, this situation um, you know, again, I think it depends. So mass tourism really depends on, uh, you know, people's capacity, uh, you know, to, to travel on mass. Obviously, airline tickets are going to be, you know, depressed in terms of prices. So it's certainly plausible that people, those who, again, who have the savings, who have the money to be able to do so, uh, to get on a plane again and travel, you know, in large numbers. And, and uh, you know, we're obviously seeing that in China. But Chinese people have a high savings rate. So even though they've suffered tremendously, you know, from the coronavirus uh, and, you know, had to restrict their mobility and, and, and incomes and business activity for, for a few months, we see them, you know, recovering. And they're at least moving around within their own country a lot. So, you know, those countries that are large, where there's lots to see and do, where it's cheap to move around, you can imagine them following the China model. Internationally, as we were saying before, it really depends on, on restrictions, lifting, and so forth. Um, then there's, um, you know, uh, countries, if you think about Italy, uh, Spain, where tourism is a double-digit percentage of GDP, they perhaps don't have a choice, you know, but to welcome or, you know, seek to attract uh, you know, lots of visitors again, but maybe try to do so in a more spread out way, you know, in a, a, in a year round way so that you don't have the kind of destruction of, you know, urban habitats or heritage uh, architecture and ruins and this kind of thing. And, but again, as you know very well, that's a conversation that was taking place prior uh, to the pandemic. So the pandemic shouldn't be the only reason why we think about this need to reinvent, this process of reinvention was sort of, you know, beginning to happen. Um, but you're right that there is a tension between the kind of, you know, economic necessity versus the kind of sustainability uh, imperative. And I just think that much like the recovery in mobility and travel itself, it's not going to be a universal global thing at the same time. You know, it's actually going to be, um, you know, sort of different countries at different speeds. Uh, if you will, but obviously we'd you know it would be good to see a sea change in a way in how the whole world thinks about these things in the spirit of what you we were saying at the beginning, which is that um, you know this is the first time in in human history that we have this synchronized kind of global standstill. So it is possible for us to do things collectively as humanity. It is possible, you know, um, and and let's see if. You know, even though this was done in, as a reaction, uh, let's see if the next things that we do um, will be, you know, can be, can be sort of proactive and positive and sustainable together. When, um, when this is all over, you know, how, how do you think you and your family's way of traveling will change? Do you think it, you will change the way you travel, the way you behave when you travel or if Will we just go back to how it was before? Well, I mean, you know, we, we were certainly pretty nonstop. Um, you know, Zara is catching up to you in the country count. It's, uh, you know, 50, <laughs> 50 plus already, and she's only 10. And uh, Zubin is a few behind because he's a couple of years younger. But, you know, I think, um, you know, we tend to, we mix business and pleasure, I guess you could say. So, you know, wh when we're traveling for work, we like to all go together somewhere and spend a little bit of extra time and immerse. 
Um, but I do think immersion is very important to us. So if we can find the time to spend a couple of weeks somewhere rather than a couple of days, that's preferable. So you learn a lot more about a place. Um, so, you know, I think that I, I would like to do more immersion, if you will. Uh, that, that I think would probably be the way and the one thing that might change in terms of how we do things to kind of pick a place and spend more time there. And perhaps in a world that's more digitally connected where one can kind of have work-life balance and not necessarily be at home, um, maybe the conditions will be more favorable uh, for that kind of adjustment uh, as well. Yeah, I think we've, we've um, uh, what you described is uh, uh, what we refer to in, the, in our industry as leisure, business and leisure, uh, something that uh, <laughs> my, wife, my wife and I actually practice very much too as we travel for business from one place to another, especially if it's a place we've never been. Uh, we, we tend to book a couple of extra days or holiday and just uh, hang around and go and explore and, and, and visit and enjoy at the same time. And certainly we'll, we'll continue to practice that uh, moving forward. And um, as uh, we will be here in Thailand until for, for another year. Uh, and uh, regrettably, in the last uh, six, uh, six years, seven years we've been here, we, we haven't actually really enjoyed uh, Thailand that much. Uh, we've mostly been traveling overseas. So certainly plan to spend more time in doing some domestic tourism, uh, which, are, which is, I think, uh, probably the first area that will open up to the various destinations and to, uh, for us to go and explore the, this beautiful country that we live in, uh, maybe a little bit more than we did before. Um, exactly. So where, where will be your next trip? What is the first place you want to go when this is all over? Well, there's, you know, a huge backlog of, of business travel, obviously. So to, to some degree, I'll be at the mercy uh, of, of uh, the dozens and dozens of events that have been uh, canceled and need to be rescheduled. But those will be kind of, you know, sprinkled into the schedule. Um, as you know, Zara and I have been traveling uh, from Scotland all the way back to Singapore uh, by train or various combinations of trains. So it's the longest overland rail journey that is geographically possible in the world. We made it as far as, uh, as Almaty, Kazakhstan. Um, and uh, just as the virus hit in February, we were meant to be getting on a plane and flying to uh, uh, Urumqi in Western China to continue the journey. So we do uh, have to prioritize that and we want to. So once uh, you know it's safe to do so, we will go back uh, and to China, go all the way through China, all the way down to Southern China. And then actually we will uh, pass through and certainly visit you because we'll go um, over the border to Chiang Mai and uh, the Eastern and Oriental Railway begins uh, in Bangkok, actually, but we'll come down from Chiang Mai and, and uh, visit you with you and join, get on the Eastern Oriental Railway and take that all the way down to Singapore, which will be the conclusion of that uh, kind of grand Eurasian rail expedition. Well, you, uh, you and your wife and your family have a, a wonderful life and uh, maybe actually this could be the topic of an, our, our next discussions, your, your travel journeys around the world are, uh, sounds absolutely uh, amazing. So um, as we're uh, about to end, we've, we've actually spent uh, over 40, 45 minutes together today. Uh, and I really appreciate uh, uh, you giving up uh, some of your time to, to join us. Any, any last words of wisdom for, for the listeners? Well, you know, I mean, I, I obviously have to reflect a fair bit because I just get asked you know, all the time by, by students, uh, especially around the world, um, in the pre-pandemic world, let's say, you know, what is your one advice to me, to us? Um, and I always said, travel, 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 travel. You know, it's the only way to build that competitive advantage to, you know, see the world in different ways, immerse, learn languages, foreign cultures, um, you know, sort of, you know, relevant knowledge uh, professionally. And it's harder, obviously. I mean, I haven't been lecturing students in the last few weeks, but I can imagine that I'm going to have to have a different answer now. As much as my heart says to continue to dispense that advice, uh, you know, my brain says, well, that's going to be harder for people to do. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's food for thought, really, in terms of big systemic uh, change. But, um, but, but the broader context of that uh, advice always used to be mobility, right? You know, focus, remember that, the, you know, ever, from an economic standpoint, the most significant way in which a person can change their lot in life, you know, their potential, is really two things. One is education and the other is mobility. 
You know, it's what you learn and where you live. Uh, and that, that is in many, many, many ways still true. So as much as, you know, people, uh, you know, are, are people, young people in particular are obviously still focused on those two things, you know, where are they going to be? Where can they enjoy a better life? So I still advocate mobility, thinking about, are you in the best place for you, uh, for what you know, for the skills you have? And um, ultimately, for, for most people in the world, that still involves potentially moving from where they are. So still thinking about mobility, don't lose that dream of mobility, even though the world is in lockdown. That might be my, my parting words. Thank you very much. That's uh, fantastic. Uh, Dr. Farad Kano, it's been absolutely wonderful to, to spend time with you and uh, to have this uh, virtual uh, coffee and tea uh, together. Uh, you from Singapore, me from Bangkok. Uh, it's been an amazing time, and again, uh, thank you very much for for uh, spending time with us this morning and sharing your point of view. Uh, one last question: When is your next book out? Oh well, that one is uh, probably uh, next year. Though we might find a way to fast track it because it is really about global migration and mobility, and you know the world population moving from what we today are calling red zones towards green zones or blue zones. Um, so I'd actually finished the book uh, at the end of last year. Um, and uh, I guess we'll see, you know, the, the publishing industry, like many others, is suffering. So not sure exactly when it will come out, but, but the topic is certainly as, as relevant as ever. And, uh, and I want to thank you as well, Mario, for, for having me on this, uh, to join you for this conversation. It's been wonderful. It's been great. I look forward to the next book. Again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Parag uh, Kana uh, from Singapore, author, scientist, and futurist. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. Take care.